Fire 11, so this is your core paper three. Uh, so look for your theory questions. Um, question three in the paper is the first physics question, so let's have a little look. We've got a distance time graph. Uh, so the first thing we need to think about is what we know about a distance time graph, and we know that the gradient is equal to the speed at any given point. Okay, that's going to help us. So it says, write the letter X on the part of the graph where the girl is walking fastest. So highest speed will be highest gradient, steepest gradient. So if you put the letter X anywhere from here up to here, that would be fine. Uh, so I am going to uh, just pop it in the middle. So I should have got things ready before I started. Uh, so X is here, the steepest part of the um, graph. You can see that that's steeper there. And then Y, where the girl is not moving, the distance is unchanged. Uh, so that is going to be the horizontal gradient section. Okay. Um, but if your answer was anywhere along here for X, that would be fine. And if your answer was anywhere along here for Y, that will also be fine. Okay, uh, so then it tells you that the girl walks a total distance of 400 metres in 800 seconds. Calculate her average speed. Okay, so that is going to be the total distance divided by the total time taken. Okay, uh, so she travels 400 metres in 800 seconds. Okay. The zeros cancel, 4 over 8 is a half, so her average speed is 0 0.5 metres per second there for the first physics question. Let me just rearrange a couple of things, sorry. Okay, then in part B, you uh, have a girl placing a brick onto a board with a rough surface, uh, so initially it just looks like this, there's the surface, there's the brick on top, um, and then this is <clears throat> tilted up to this angle at some point later. Uh, but the brick doesn't slide down the slope, so what is the name of the force that prevents the brick from moving? Well, that's friction. That should have been fairly obvious to you. Uh, suggest how the motion of the brick would be different if a board with a smooth surface was used. Use your common sense in life. Um, you know that the friction is less when you have a smooth surface. You're more likely to slip. Okay, so the brick would um, start to move at a smaller angle. Is one thing you could have said. Or you could have said the brick slides down more quickly. Okay, or faster, a word like that would be fine. State the type of energy that decreases as the brick moves down the board. Okay, uh, so you know that they are moving through a height, the brick is moving uh, down as well as across, so you know that gravitational potential energy is lost. So we just need to write that down. Okay, uh, so that's part B. <clears throat> then in part C, it moves on to a moments question. So you can see uh, the girl clamps a ruler to the side of the table. So you can see the pivot point is here. Okay, the force is then applied acting vertically down. So we push the ruler um, and the perpendicular distance, because remember that this is at 90 degrees, so the direction of the force, is 0.27. So the moment of a force is equal to the product of force multiplied by perpendicular distance. So that is going to be 40 newtons multiplied by 0.27 metres. And when I do that... I get uh, 10.8 newton meters 
as my final answer there for a moment. <clears throat> okay, so please make sure that you write your equation uh, and not just your final answer. They want to see that in the question. Okay, next question is number six. So uh, have a little look at question six. It is a question about solids, liquids and gases. They have different properties. They want you to draw two lines from each state of matter to the correct properties. Okay, so let's finish off a gas first. We know that we can compress a gas, so we can squash it into a smaller space. And we also know that a gas is able to flow. The molecules are free to move around. Okay, uh, then we know a liquid is also able to flow. You know that you can pour a liquid, so we need to have connected those two. But it is difficult to compress. Okay, it's not easy to compress at all. Okay, the reason for that in a liquid, although the bonds are weak, they are still there. Okay, so the, the molecules are all in contact with each other already. There's no space in between them to push them closer together. Okay, that's a common misconception there. And then lastly, hopefully you can get this, uh, a solid obviously has a fixed shape. Uh, and also it is difficult to compress. You have, uh, your bonds are very strong. Your rigid lattice structure, there's no space in between really uh, to compress to, to uh, show that. Whereas with a gas, there's obviously a lot of space in between molecules so it's very easy to push them close together okay then in the next part of the question it says when a liquid is heated it, it expands describe how the structure of a liquid in glass thermometer is designed to make use of this property okay so we know that a liquid in glass thermometer is just the one that you use in the lab um, so you'll see uh, a core in the middle that's often red um, and you've got some red liquid in there so describing how the structure so the physical shape of it um, affects how we use the thermometer you need to say that the liquid is held inside of a tube that's the first thing okay that's the structure of it um, and then as it is heated it rises up the tube okay so as the liquid is heated it rises up the tube which allows us to see that change okay uh, and then when a liquid is heated to a high enough temperature it starts to boil state the meaning of the term boiling point it is the temperature at which, so the temperature point where a liquid turns into a gas. Okay, so you have to refer to temperature and you have to refer to liquid and gas. In part C, you've got a list of materials um, and you have to decide which ones are um, good thermal conductors, which ones are thermal insulators. So we know that metals are good conductors. So the first thing is to just look for the metals. So we've got aluminium, copper and steel and plastic and wool are insulators. Okay. If you got three of these right, you could have one mark. You needed all of them right to get the second mark. Uh, then it says, state the name of the process that transfers thermal energy from the sun through the vacuum of space. So the heat transfer that doesn't need a medium is radiation. So you just have to remember that key term there. Complete the sentence to describe sound waves. So sound waves transfer something without transferring matter. That word there is energy. Okay. The approximate range of audible frequencies for a healthy human ear is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Okay. 
The pitch and loudness of a sound wave are increased. State how the amplitude and the frequency of the sound wave changes. Okay, so amplitude is a measure of loudness. The amplitude has to increase to make a louder sound. So if I draw an original wave that looks something like this, to make that louder, if I have my equilibrium point, I have to have a higher amplitude for a louder sound. Okay. So that's quiet, that's loud. Now frequency is to do with pitch. Okay, so if I draw a wave that looks like this and call that low frequency and I draw another one that looks like this, that's high frequency. Okay, so I can see more waves in a space of time. Uh, the frequency has increased. Pitch is to do with frequency. High pitch is high frequency, low pitch is low frequency. So we also have to increase our frequency to hear a higher pitch. Okay, next question is number nine. So we've got a lens, some light coming in uh, parallel to the lens, and then it converges to a point on a screen. On figure 9.1, show the focal length of the thin converging lens using a double-headed arrow. Okay, so the focal point is the point where the light rays meet, so that's there. Okay, and the centre of the lens is obviously shown by that line there. The distance from the centre of the lens to the focal point is the focal length. So that is my focal length of my lens. Label the position, oh, I've done this bit already, <laughs> of the principal focus, this is the focal point. That's what that means, with the letter F. Okay. And then another thing you have to do is add visible light into the correct position. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light is right next to ultraviolet, okay, on the spectrum. So we're going to put visible light in here. Okay, and then you've got infrared, microwaves, gamma rays. Okay, but visible light goes in that middle one there. X-rays are used to look at bones in the body. What is a safety precaution we take when we're looking at ionizing radiation? Uh, the doctor might leave the room before the image is taken or um, a lead vest could be worn. Okay, so if you are having an x-ray on your leg, you might be asked to wear a lead vest uh, over your torso so that your torso is protected. Uh, so the next question is to state two other examples of ionising radiation. So you could have chosen any two from alpha it would have been okay if you did this symbol, beta or gamma. Okay, um, obviously only choose two. If they specify the number of things you have to give, only ever give that amount. Okay, I'm just giving you all of the options uh, so that you know whether you've got yours right or wrong. State one effect of ionizing radiation on living things. Uh, so it can cause cancer it can cause cell mutations, it can cause cell death, you could have chosen those options there. Okay, uh, so it's to do with the cells and the impact that that has. In part C, it's still about radioactivity, uh, you've got a radioactive material tested in a hotel lab, um, the sample has moved away from the detector, explain why there is still some radiation detected by the radiation detector. There is always background ra uh, radiation, okay, even without a particular radioactive source, there is always background radiation, okay, um, and that could come from the ground is a common source, 
It could have come from rocks or plants. And it could have come from cosmic rays. Okay, those are some options that you could have given for where that comes from. Number 12 is an electricity question. So we have a series circuit here. That's important to identify because it helps us know what's happening with current and voltage. Uh, so we know that the current is the same everywhere in a series circuit. That's one of our rules. So when the switch is closed, ammeter 1 reads 0 0.5 amps. Okay, but this time the switch has been closed. It's a complete circuit. Well, if it's 0 0.5 amps here, it also has to be 0 0.5 amps here as well. It's a series circuit, so you just write the same value. A boy measures the potential difference across the resistor, so that's the voltage. So let's say we put this in here like we know to do. Name the instrument. That is a voltmeter. Okay. In part B, we've got two resistors in parallel this time. Identify from the list the most likely value of the combined resistors in parallel. Okay, you don't even need to do a calculation to answer this because you know that resistance decreases when you add them in parallel. So you can look for the one that's smaller. But just to reassure you, we can use the equation. So we have 1 over R total is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, okay, for resistors in parallel. So, we have that being equal to 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4, which is 2 over 4, which you can hopefully see is a half. Okay, that is equal to 1 over R total. This one is this one, R total is this 2, okay. So, therefore, 2 is the right answer. I've proved it to you just so that you're happy with that. You're going to choose the 2 ohm and you're going to explain that by saying when you add resistors in parallel the total resistance of the circuit will decrease. And in part C, you just need to choose the correct words. So, the flow of charge in a circuit is called the, the blank. This is a full stop. Something is a measure of the difficulty for a charge to flow in an electric circuit. So, the flow of charge is called the current. And resistance is a measure of how difficult it is for a charge to flow. You obviously needed one for each mark there. Question 13 is about half-life. So, stu a student A, B or C is trying to define half-life. Half-life is half the time for the activity of the sample to decrease to zero. No, that is not correct. Half-life is the time taken for the activity of the sample to decrease to half its original value. That's not bad. Half-life for C is the time taken for the activity of the sample to decrease to half its original value. So, it is C. Sorry, I was just looking at what the difference is. This is it's quite misleading. Look carefully. It's either the time taken or half the time taken. That's the difference between student B and C. To decrease to half its original value, it is the time taken for half of its original value, not half of the time taken. Uh, so it's student C there. So just be really careful with your reading. Uh, here, uh, part B, figure 12.1 shows two samples of the same substance, uh, emits beta particles, which is the same. So it's the same thing, but we've obviously got a much bigger mass on the left and a much smaller mass on the right. So it's definitely not the mass of the samples. They're different. So we know that the half-life of a particular isotope is constant, so it's definitely going to be the half-life. The number of atoms decaying each second is not going to be the same 
um, because you have a different sample size and therefore the number of beta particles emitted is also not going to be the same. So it should, should just be the top one that you've ticked there. And then in C, you've got a uh, curve of count rate. So you can see that initially the count rate was 2,000 uh, counts per minute. Then it says that we take that sample um, and it arrives at the factory recording 1,000 counts per minute and you have to work out how long that journey took. So all you have to do is find 1,000 counts and then track to see that time. And you can see that clearly says four hours. Okay, so you just write four hours there. I think that's it. Yep, yeah, fab.